Welcome to The Writing Life, the podcast for anyone who writes. I'm Steph McKenna. And I'm James Gill. From the National Centre for Writing here at Dragon Hall in Norwich. As part of the annual Norfolk and Norwich Festival, we run a series of events called City of Literature. A central part of our programme is the Harriet Martineau Lecture, which celebrates the legacy of a remarkable, world-changing woman by inviting globally renowned radical speakers to respond to her life and work. So in 2022, we were very excited to welcome best-selling novelist, memoirist and literary activist Kit Deval. She presented the lecture in the beautiful environs of the Spiegel Tent in Chapelfield Gardens. Kit gave a thought-provoking lecture covering a range of topics, including human rights, equality, hunger, and as she calls it, compassion without judgment. Kit is a fantastic writer and speaker, and in the course of the lecture, talks about social mobility and what it really takes, how smartphones are essential for some of the most marginalised people in society, as well as quoting Terry Pratchett as she explains what keeps the poorest in our society poor. This episode is that lecture, recorded at the event back in May. More relevant now than ever, with inflation rampant, the cost of living impacting everyone in society, and the energy crisis hitting those with the least worst of all. If you're interested, you can find out more about Kit Naval and Harriet Martineau on our website, nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk. This is a profound and moving lecture, so strap in for 45 minutes of Harriet Martineau lecture with the amazing Kit Naval. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the City of Literature at Norfolk Norwich Festival 2022. The City of Literature programme is a Norfolk and Norwich Festival and a National Centre for Writing presentation programmed by my fantastic colleagues here at the National Centre for Writing. My name is Chris. I'm the Chief Exec at the National Centre for Writing. I want to first of all thank you for joining us for this very special event in which we are really delighted to welcome Kit Deval to give this year's Harriet Martineau Lecture. Harriet Martineau Lecture, or the, the Harriet Martineau Lecture, celebrates the legacy of a remarkable Norwich-born and world-changing woman. Uh, a radical, a journalist, a sociologist, an experimenter, a campaigner for prison reform at times, a campaigner for abolition. Uh, her life and works read like uh, an incredible adventure story. And uh, every year when we've commissioned this lecture in her name, we've sort of given links to her work to the writers and, and authors we've approached. And it's been like giving people a set of keys to a mansion. Every time the writers have come back having explored the different rooms that Harriet's work and her life and her personality have let them into. I was very excited today to hear from Kit. Kit um, is a novelist and writer known to you all, I'm sure, brought up among the Irish community of Birmingham in the 60s and 70s. Her debut novel, My Name is Leon, was an international bestseller, shortlisted for the Costa First Novel Award for the Desmond Elliott Prize, and was the winner of the Kerry Group Irish Novel of the Year in 2017. I think we established earlier the TV adaptation and starts on BBC Two a week on Friday, so press the record button. I've seen the trailer four times and I've still got a lump in my throat when it comes on. Her second novel, uh, the Trick to Time was long-listed for the Women's Prize, <clears throat> Excuse me, and her young adult novel, Becoming Diner, was shortlisted for the Carnegie Clip Award in 2020. She was also the inspiration uh, behind the crowdfunded, uh, inspiration and editor behind the crowdfunded anthology of working class people, Common People, which was published in 2018, and which two writers from this region were really um, delighted to be part of. She was the co-founder of the free, uh, di the free Digital Big Book Weekend in 2020. Remember all the way back when digital festivals were brand new and nobody had any idea what they would do? Kit was there starting for an open book for everybody with TV. And in 20, uh, 2019, I think, Kit was named the Future Book Person of the Year. Our thanks from the festival and from Writers' Centre and the National Centre for Writing go to the Martineau Society and Arts Council England, whose support has made this event possible. And we'd like to thank the Book Hive, again, who will be selling Kit's books today. I should say that the Book Hive has nearly sold out of Kit's books already. Um, at, from about 10 o'clock this morning, they were being um, bought. If you aren't able to get a book from uh, Kit today or the Book Hive, uh, her new memoir, which comes out on August the 18th and is called Without Warning and Only Sometimes, which is a brilliant title, is available for pre-order. Kit will be signing book plates, and if you buy one of those today, you'll get a signed book plate and a 20% discount from the Book Hive on publication. And Henry has promised to walk around to your house individually. And no, he didn't do the latter bit, <laughs> but he will ensure that you get your book should you buy it today. 
Um, filming and photography might take place at different parts during the afternoon. If you would prefer not to appear on any photographs or films, just let someone with a festival badge or a, a National Centre for Writing badge know, and we'll make sure that that is complied with. Um, it's a joy to be together again in the Spiegel tent with electricity. Uh, and thank you again for your patience and for being here with us today. I hope you enjoy the event, and I'm now going to hand over to Kit Duval to hear Tend the Garden Where You Stand. Kit. Hello everyone, it's great to be here. I nearly said when I was sitting down, I said, it's great to be in this tent. It's so not a tent. I mean, it's beautiful, beautiful surroundings. And I'm going to read, normally I would look at people, but I'm going to read and I'll look up from time to time. I found out recently that the Q in LGBTQIA plus stands not only for queer, but for questioning. And I made a mental note. I don't want to offend or exclude anyone, and I want to be respectful of everyone's gender and sexual identity, even when they themselves are unsure. A few weeks ago, someone told me that you shouldn't recycle anything smaller than a credit card. That includes straws, bottle caps, coffee pods, plastic cutlery, paper clips, and a million other tiny things that are too small to be sorted and can jam the recycling equipment. I made a note and stopped just short of going through my recycling looking for any offending articles. A recent report shows that suicide amongst the Irish travelling community is six times higher than the general population of Ireland due to extreme human rights abuses, racism and discrimination. A really good charity looking after young travellers needs funds, advice and support. And after reading the report, I wondered how I could help. I made a note. I make a note of the terrible prison riots in Ecuador where women and disabled people are killed by warring gangs, of the starving people in the Yemen, all 10 million of them, of the savage butchery in Ukraine, and the children that meet their death every day in the Mediterranean on the cusp of a better life in Europe, of the women that drown off the coast of Kent, their hands reaching out towards the country I live in, me, sitting comfortably at home, only a few hundred miles away. I try not to forget the people of Afghanistan still trying to make their voices heard and the First Nation people of Australia and America who continue to live second-class lives in the lands of their ancestors. I make a note, I make a note, I make a note until the notes overwhelm me. Social media, 24-hour television, rolling news, bulletins straight to your phone, there was none of that back in the day. Then you had to be proactive to be involved and up to date. When I was young, actually until maybe 20 years ago, the news was a once or twice a day affair you'd catch on the radio or at night before you went to bed. Then on Sundays you did a deeper dive into the weekend papers and caught up with all the things you'd missed. But even then, the whole of world news covered maybe five or six pages in the broadsheets. And if there were no pictures, I tended to scan and skip until I got to the culture section for books, films and music. But now we are force-fed information, accurate and inaccurate, fake and real. And where it used to take real effort to be informed, now you have to make twice that effort to unplug. And anyway, when the pandemic was at its worst, the news was exactly what we wanted – we needed to know what to do and what the rules were. At least some of us did. I mean, I won't go into it. I'm not going there. We needed to know the latest way to stay safe and protect others, where to go for food and petrol. And most of all, we wanted reassurance. We wanted to know that things were getting better, that the nightmare might soon end. For many of us, the news became the most important part of the day, and so began a dangerous trend of checking in, signing up for bulletins, being hyper-alert on social media, on TV and radio, and addicted to checking our phones. During the pandemic, I downloaded one of those apps that help you meditate. It's called Calm. Each day, it reminds you to try and carve out some time for yourself and concludes with an affirmation that you're supposed to remember throughout the day. 
Recently, the meditation was about trying to find peace, and the advice was, tend the garden where you stand. Usually, I can't wait to get up and get on with my day, tick the meditation off my to-do list, thus defeating the point of the thing, and forget all about the affirmation. But this one stayed with me. Tend the garden where you stand. What did it mean? It means the very opposite of the endless consumption of disturbing news with the only option of pressing the like button or signing a petition. Not that either of those things are pointless, but they rarely change anything except our blood pressure. Tending the garden where you stand is about personal connection, personal responsibility, local responsibility, local action, me doing something for you in the here and now, feeling connected to someone or something and tending to that thing. But what's the garden? On a physical level, the garden we stand in is our local area, our street, our tower block, our neighbours, our partner, our children, our parents. It's the things we can reach out and touch and affect with our actions, a hug here, litter picking there, organising or attending a local event somewhere we can physically nurture or tend by looking after it, our community, our friends and family. This is a place we can support economically too, choosing to spend our money on local providers of services and goods and making sure our pound goes to the people we care about, whose welfare and prosperity affects us. We can get involved in local initiatives to better our area, be it building an urban garden, supporting climate action, traffic calming, or local politics on health and education. These are the things that take more than a like, take more than scrolling to the next Twitter post, and they are more likely to significantly impact everyday lives. A well-tended garden flourishes, grows, looks beautiful, and that could be our goal. But beyond the physical, we all stand in a figurative space, a space we feel connected to on a deep personal level. And whilst most of us care to some degree about climate change, the NHS, the refugee crisis and older people, there might be one of those issues that has a much deeper and profound resonance. For me, the space I'm connected to is about not having enough. Call it poverty, call it being poor, call it being economically disadvantaged. That's my garden. I was brought up to believe that paradise was just around the corner. My mother was a Jehovah's Witness. And in thrice weekly meetings and Bible study, we were assured that the world as it was didn't meet God's exacting, loving and merciful standards. He was sick of the abuses of the church. He was sick of lying, cheating politicians. And he was sick of the way the poor were treated. He promised an end to all of it, to political and religious shenanigans. Remember Jesus condemning the scribes and the Pharisees? An end to sickness and health. Just look how Jesus mended blindness and death itself. He promised an end to poverty. Just look what Jesus did with five loaves and two fishes. I was too young to worry about sickness and ill health, totally uninterested in priests and politicians, but a man that could conjure up a family dinner from scraps. Now, that caught my attention. Paradise, God called it, and I could not wait. I imagined a different house to the small terrace that was home to seven of us, with wall-to-wall carpet, cupboards stuffed with food, up-to-date clothes and everlasting dinners, with the sort of English puddings I saw on telly, sweets, biscuits and a warm bed in a warm bedroom and no school. The no school bit was nothing to do with poverty, but God loves a chancer. (laughs) My tending of this garden, my interest in poverty, means reading about it, talking about it, writing about it, and making sure I'm up to date on the research. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation are one of the most thorough and well-respected organisations doing work in this area. And some of the phrases you will hear when poverty is discussed in research and reports are... Persistent poverty, deep poverty, destitution, working poverty, out-of-work poverty, low-income poverty, pensioner poverty, child poverty. What this tells us is that poverty has different faces, 
And whether you are working or unemployed, young and healthy or old, or disabled, it can affect you. And how long you live in poverty also looks different. Persistent poverty can lead to deep poverty, and there's even a rung below that line. It's called destitution. In 2019, only three years ago, by the way, the same year Boris Johnson became Prime Minister, two and a half million people in this country were destitute. Imagine what the pandemic has done to those figures. Imagine what austerity has done to those figures. Imagine what inflation and the energy bill increase will do to those figures. Projections are that the perfect storm of rising prices, f fuel increases and inflation mean that this year alone an extra 1.2 million people will be pushed from just managing into poverty. Unless you've been there, it can be very difficult to imagine real poverty and destitution. And yet we have celebrity cooks standing in luxury kitchens telling us how to make nutrition me nutritious meals on a modest budget. Or we have politi politicians spending a single night on the streets to get in touch with homelessness or living for a week on income support to show us how it can be done. Who can forget when the Tory MP Matthew Paris was filmed for World in Action in 1984 showing us how it was possible to live on supplementary benefit, as it was then called, of £26.84 for one week. Or Michael Portillo taking on the responsibilities of a single parent of four children, feeding himself and the whole family on £80 a week. Both experiments, as I remember, were what my son would call epic fails. Even if tomorrow, say, you found yourself unemployed and on universal credit, many of us still have no idea what poverty is actually like. We have no idea what broke really means. It doesn't mean a nil balance in your bank account. It means debt. Hunger does not mean there's no dinner tonight. It means there was no dinner in 2020 and 2015, and probably in 1974, when you were born, there was no dinner then either. Most of us have a house full of furniture and bedding and carpets and light fittings and towels and a modernish TV and broadband and saucepans and cutlery and a mixing bowl and a table and chairs and a winter coat and winter coats for our children if we have them. We have shoes, probably more than one pair, and shampoo and sanitary towels and washing up liquid and underwear, day clothes and night clothes and a handbag or two or seven. And our children know there is bread in the cupboard and jam and butter and biscuits and treats occasionally. And when there's a school trip, they can go and not feel ashamed of their clothes. And when it's Christmas, they will get proper presents and they might have a birthday party and presents again. And when they watch the telly, and see adverts of big families eating big Sunday dinners around a table buckling under the weight of the food, and everyone laughing as the gravy is poured. They don't wonder what it's like to sit in front of a plate that disappears onto chicken and roast potatoes, because they have it all the time. Many of us here, and I include myself, would take months, maybe years, to get to the point where we have sold everything there is to sell, to pay the heating bill and buy food. We might have a little put away, we might have a car, we might have a pension, we might have family and friends who would rally round because they're kind and generous and not in the same boat. When you live in poverty, your family and your friends likely live in poverty too. There is no one to bail you out, no one to ask for a favour. And if there was, you have already done it and once too often. As a measure of what deprivation means in practice, we can use the European Index of Deprivation from 2017. These are the questions it asks. Can you face unexpected expenses, afford a one-week annual holiday away from home, avoid arrears in mortgage or rent, utility bills or higher purchase instalments, 
Afford a meal with meat, chicken or fish every second day. Afford to keep the home adequately warm and afford to have a car or van for personal use. A replace worn out clothes with some new ones. Have two pairs of properly fitting shoes. Spend a small amount of money each week on yourself. Have regular leisure activities. Get together with friends, family for a drink or a meal at least once a month. Have internet connection and replace worn out furniture. If you can't meet at least five of those 13 indicators, you are in deprivation. Many people in deprivation in the UK cannot meet a single one of those indicators, with the idea of an annual one-week holiday being laughable. A long, bitter and mirthless laugh. On top of all of that, if you are deprived, it's likely you live in a deprived area. That is to say, without those things essential to a vibrant and th thriving community, a library, a community centre, playgroups, doctors, dentists, a youth club, I don't think anyone's got youth clubs anymore, a fire station and a police station, a housing office. Lose those things and hot on its heels comes the loss of the bank and the post office, supermarkets, pubs and places of worship. Then the bus service stops. Then buildings that are abandoned are boarded up. Visible reminders as though you needed any that your area is not viable. Any local jobs went with the businesses and public services and the schools are not attracting the best teachers nor the funding they need to keep cold and hungry children awake and engaged with learning. When you are born or fall into persistent poverty, there never is nor never was enough. Your childhood was one of going without and very often feeling embarrassment or shame. It won't be a surprise to anyone that there's a link between poverty and poor mental health. On its own, the worry over how to feed yourself and your children would be enough to make anyone anxious. Add to that, substandard housing, debt and job insecurity or job invisibility, and you have the right mixture for serious depression. Just going to bed every night thinking about the trials of the next day when you are on serious material hardship can be unbearably debilitating, no matter how used you are to that being the norm. Poverty wears you down, leads to feelings of shame, worthlessness, anguish and depression. Also, unless you live in poverty, you may not understand how expensive it is to be poor. Many people who struggle to pay their bills have an electric meter and that meter will be on the highest tariff. So you'll be paying more for your energy than people who pay quarterly or monthly. You might have to have an expensive pay-as-you-go mobile phone tariff if you can't afford a two-year contract. Mobile phones are essential for anyone on benefits or job seekers, by the way, and many benefit job and welfare applications are done almost entirely online or on your phone. You may not be able to buy food in bulk or three for two offers and take advantage of special offers in supermarkets or afford the bus fare to go to the large out of town supermarkets in the first place. In all sorts of ways, you are penalized for not having ready cash or a decent credit score. In one of his Discworld books, Terry Pritchett put it this way, calling it the Sam Vines Boots Theory of Socioeconomic Unfairness. And this is what he said. The reason that the rich are so rich, Veams reasoned, was because they managed to spend less money. Take Boots, for example. He earned $38 a month plus allowances. A really good pair of leather boots cost $50. But an affordable pair of boots, which were okay for a season or two and then leaked like hell when the cardboard gave out, cost about $10. Those were the kind of boots Vimes always brought and wore until the soles were so thin that he could tell where he was in Ankh-Morpork on a foggy night by the feel of the cobbles. But the thing was that good boots lasted for years and years. 
a man who could afford $50 had a pair of boots that would still be keeping his feet dry in 10 years' time, while the poor man, who could only afford cheap boots, would have spent $100 on boots in that same time and would still have wet feet. Of course, there still exists in this country the idea that we live in a meritocracy. In other words, with the right combination of skill, drive and ability, you can rise to the top. The top being the place where decisions about who makes it to the top are made. So then, there is this pervasive idea that if you are poor, then either you haven't got the brains, or you're not good at anything, or you're just not trying hard enough to claw your way out of your dire circumstances. In other words, you are right where you should be, where you deserve to be. We in Britain have had a version of the deserving and the undeserving poor bollocks since Victoria times, and possibly even before that. The introduction of workhouses in 1834 was an attempt to make looking after the poor cheaper on the parish. Workhouses were built purposely to resemble prisons with low ceilings and small windows and the horrendous conditions inside, splitting up families, terrible food, having to wear a uniform and do monotonous unpaid work, was an attempt to keep people so afraid of them that they would do anything rather than succumb. We don't have workhouses today, though if ever you read any of the public comments in The Guardian or online whenever poverty is discussed, you'd realise how many people would welcome their return. You only have to read the right-wing press to get an idea of how poor people are viewed. Scroungers, liars, cheats, slags, thieves, idlers, and of course, so stupid they can't make their universal credit stretch from one week to the next. Recently, a working mother made a very tearful and heartbreaking call to a radio station about the increase in her fuel bill. She said that she cannot afford to heat the house for her children, has turned the boiler off, and they eat one meal a day. This was the response from one listener. Bet she made that call on an iPhone 13. This despite the unbelievable statistic that 80 people a day are dying in cold, unheated homes. On Twitter, a man called Kevin posted his response to a nurse who admitted that after a 13-hour shift, she comes home and finds there isn't enough for herself and her children to eat, so she has to skip a meal. Kevin's advice is this. You can buy a big bag of dried pasta that would feed a family for 50p. If you shop and cook properly, you can eat healthy meals really cheaply. I would love to see how she spends her salary. I'm awarding Kevin the bronze medal for being out of touch, condescending, and in his case, stupid. Sorry. Silver medal goes to the Environment Secretary, George Eustace, who counsels poor people to buy value brands in the supermarket, something they've hitherto never considered. <laughs> he doesn't comment on the nutritional content of the value brand, which is so often a false economy. He does not credit poor people with the common sense, inventiveness and micro-planning that has so far kept them alive. He would do well to listen to Oscar Wilde, who said, to recommend thrift to the poor is both grotesque and insulting. It's like advising a man who is starving to eat less. Gold medal in the out of touch, condescending and uninformed category is reserved for the Conservative MP, Lee, Lee Anderson, who said, there is not this massive use for food banks in this country, but generation after generation who cannot cook properly. They can't cook a meal from scratch and they cannot budge it. It takes a 20-year-old footballer called Marcus Rashford, himself no stranger to hard times, to make the government take food poverty seriously when he forced the government to make a U-turn on whether or not children could be fed in school holidays. He gets another sort of gold medal entirely. Food, how much we spend on it and whether we spend it judiciously, is often used as a barometer of respectability, with the most savage accusations reserved for the working class or those on benefits. 
a couple of years ago, Bath Conservatives said that parents who can't feed their children on ten, £10 pounds a week were indolent and dysfunctional. Another writer, Herman Melville of Moby Dick fame, would answer this way. Of all the preposterous assumptions of humanity over humanity, nothing exceeds most of the criticisms, criticisms made on the habits of the poor by the well-housed, well-warmed, and well-fed. Or, as activist Jack Munro says in her food blog, some people are working two or three zero-hour contracts and barely have time to change from their supermarket checkout uniform to their cleaning tabard, let alone knock up a vegetable gratin from scratch and make their own granola. Or, as she so aptly puts it, my ready meal is none of your fucking business. Jack Munro regularly publishes recipes for cheap meals on social media for free. By cheap, I mean 40 pence per portion, or even less during using economy tins of vegetables and the cheapest version of rice and pasta. She costs in flour and oil and sugar and salt and all those ingredients that regular chefs assume you have in your cupboard. Soy sauce, herbs, seasoning, garlic paste, tomato puree. puree. Every single teaspoon of something costs something and Jack Munro knows it. I can't speak highly enough of her mostly unsung efforts to help people in poverty eat well. And because she speaks from experience, she makes sure that, that as well as the food being cheap, it's also nutritious and filling. She has a website and a blog and a PayPal page where you can donate money that she uses to continue her work. No matter how inventive you are and Sorry, no matter how inventive you are and how much you compare prices and shop around, it's not easy to eat well on bene benefits or minimum wage. As researchers from the Cambridge University Centre for Diet and Activity Research proved in 2012, when they found that a thousand calories made up from healthy items, such as lean salmon, yogurt and tomatoes, cost an average of £7.49 pence. The same calorie intake from less healthy items, such as pizza, beef burger, and donuts, could be purchased for an average of £2.50. And things have become significantly worse since then. In that same year, 2012, in Britain, food banks gave three-day emergency food supplies to 128,000 people. Last year, it was well over 2 million. This in a country where the shelf stackers who were lauded and applauded during the pandemic have returned to invisibility, cramming shelves with food they cannot afford to buy. The same nurse that should be better at budgeting and live on raw pasta for a week cannot eat the saucepan clanging clap she got during the pandemic and now has to five, find five pounds a day to park a car in the hospital car park. The pandemic's over, love. Get your purse out. The poor we will always have with us, Jesus said in often quoted scriptures by some Christian MPs like Rees Mogg, who think the state of affairs of having destitute people in our midst is just the way it's always been. And food banks are rather uplifting as they show what a wonderfully compassionate country we are. He forgets perhaps that Jesus also counseled a wealthy man to sell all he had and distribute the money to the poor or that he threw the moneylenders out of the temple and fed poor people with whatever he had to hand. As far as I can remember from my study of the scriptures, which is extensive, Jesus didn't eat lavish dinners in a subsidised government canteen, claim thousands in motor and expenses, and keep his wealth offshore to avoid paying tax, while the poor of his parish divided a box of economy fish fingers into four for an evening meal. Hunger is one of the key drivers of survival. It's the reason our ancestors left the safety of their homes and faced the danger of hunting for food. I know what it's like to have that driver turned up to 11 every minute of every day. Even when your belly is full, you know it's temporary. You know it's uncertain. And it affects you for the rest of your life. 
you will always, one way or another, feel a kind of hunger and a fear of ever returning there. But what about social mobility? Isn't that the answer? Isn't it the route out of your situation? If you're clever, if you can bypass having no breakfast but yet be good at school and pay attention to your lessons while your belly cramps, and if you can pass all your exams after doing your homework in a freezing living room on an ancient laptop five of you have to share, you might get a scholarship to a public school or pass your 11 plus and go to grammar school and get a hardship loan for the uniform and not feel too embarrassed in front of your well-heeled schoolmates who go to Verbier and the Maldives for their holidays while you get a job in a call centre for the summer. And then, if you're not teased and derided for your northern accent or your Brummie accent, or your Devon twang while you're doing your bar exams, oh, by the way, they take place in London, so I hope you've got £900 a month for a room in Peckham. And then, oh yes, social mobility has succeeded where your lazy, budget-shy parents failed. You're a lawyer, you're a doctor, you're a businessman. Doesn't that prove that social mobility works? No. What it proves is that either by accident or attitude, some children can defy the statistics, but only if they have sufficient drive that appears at the right time in the right school, with the right teacher, under the right scheme, with the right parental support and everlasting determination and that much overused and misunderstood resilience. Should you be one of the children that have a learning difference or come into your own at 38 and find your skill is as, as an artist or a musician rather than a reader of texts? Should you find yourself with two children and crippling rent when you realise what you want to do with your life but have no time and too many responsibilities to realise your dreams? Or you have no idea of the concept of social mobility because your parents and your grandparents and everyone you know is living in the same conditions that you are and nothing ever seems to change, then that experiment has failed. Social mobility cherry picks the brightest and most able while leaving their families behind. The antidote to poverty isn't to save one or two kids with the best brains, but to provide opportunities for whole communities with good schools, good teachers who are valued and supported, extra school activities, breakfast clubs if necessary, and mentors for all. For children of five, for teenagers, for women of 38, for men of 55, for all people, for always. Whether we are poor or not, poverty affects us all. This chipping away at the mortar that used to hold a decent welfare system together, this endless stream of hardship stories on top of two years of not knowing whether you would live or die, and indeed watching people, watch other people die, saying goodbye on iPads, zooming in for your grandmother's funeral. All of this has an effect on our sense of ourselves as humans, our relationship to our community, our sense of a shared space and shared dignity. We are all the poorer, for at best the ignorance, at worst the callousness of our elected leaders to the plight of so many children who are very unlikely to escape the start they have had in life, to the old people who sit alone in unheated homes. And it really can affect us all. Who knows where we will be tomorrow? We are all a bad decision, a bad accident, a sudden disaster, or a couple of decades away from poverty. We are all simply the death of the breadwinner away from poverty, the loss of a job away from poverty, another pandemic away from poverty. And just one year of poverty can lead to persistent poverty, which in turn leads to destitution unless something is done to interrupt that cycle. And what is being done? And who is doing it? You are doing it. And so am I. Every time you, from your taxed income, drop a tin of beans into the food bank box at the front of Sainsbury's, you try and interrupt the cycle, or at least stop its acceleration. 
every time you volunteer at a charity that provides days out for families on income support, every time you donate, do a fun run, help out at school, put your winter coat in a clothes bank, whatever you do, you are trying. Your time and your money is moving in where the welfare state used to live. And one MP from Liverpool, Ian Byrne, is trying to make access to food a human right. There's an overwhelming amount of goodness out there. People who quietly go about changing things in their communities and invisibly helping out in lots of unacknowledged ways and not just to people they know. I recently did a tweet asking anyone if they knew of any charities providing free holidays for people on low income. My friend who's on universal credit has breast cancer. And after her surgery, she wanted to take her two young children away to make up for all the time that she'd been ill, having chemotherapy. I thought there might be a fund that provided that kind of thing. The tweet went out at half past 10 in the morning. By the following day, I had £3,000 in my bank account in her name and the offer of two luxury holiday homes in Wales and Dorset. Two welfare advisors got in touch to offer their services. A pro bono lawyer did the same, and she has offers of support too numerous to mention. This is the other side of the live on pasta, learn to budget lobby. This is the kindness of strangers, immediate, generous, wise, compassionate, and practical. No one commented on whether or not she had an iPhone 13 and why she was on universal credit in the first place. They said, this has happened to me, or this happened to my mom, sister, friend, or most often, there but for the grace of God go I. This is the garden I stand in, tended to by millions, a garden I know well and speak about whenever I have the opportunity. I'm a writer, so I write about these things. My writing is my resistance. It's my political stance. And as Eli Wiesel said, silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. We must interfere. I go on about it in my super woke, politically correct, lefty snowflake, can't take a joke way, and I make no apologies for it. Part of our tending our garden is weeding. When you pluck something out and throw it on the fire, cut the head off something you'd rather not see into blossom, better yet, drag it out by the root. But from time to time, we do have to do a little weeding, that internal stock t check you make when you look at yourself and your attitudes or responses and see if there's room for change. So we can try to constantly reevaluate our behavior when we come across new information. Look how we change the terms we use to describe people living with a disability, people who are, who are neurodiverse, people's pronouns and the way they wish to be described. We never want to give offense. So we look at ourselves and our actions and thoughts and we tweak, we change, we weed it out. In all sorts of ways, we strive to be better people, to live in a better garden tomorrow than we stood in today. Surprise fact, I'm a little outspoken, a little militant, a little all or nothing. I had to go through this essay and change, have to and must, to try to and think about. I'm working on the weeding bit. For many of us, tending the garden we stand in is looking after ourselves and our families and the people we love. And that is enough sometimes more than enough. Do we judge people who do not get involved in our local communities for whatever reason, who know nothing of international or world politics? Some of us don't have the emotional capacity for one more thing. Do we judge people who do not vote? Sometimes people are so disenfranchised, so beaten down and so suspicious, so hopeless, that they think no one cares, that nothing will make a difference, and sometimes they're right. Those people nevertheless go to work, love their children, and look after their parents. That's their garden, and that's their life from day to day, and that is enough. Sometimes the basics of life are the garden we tend. 
Did I get up today and have a shower? Well done me. Did I manage not to take drugs or drink? Did I get the children into bed? Did I leave the house? Did I walk to the park? Did I buy a newspaper? Did I call on my mother and make her a meal? That is enough if that's all I can manage. We do the best we can in the circumstances we find ourselves with the hand we were dealt, within the families we come from, with our mental health and our physical health, and that is enough too. And if we cannot manage to stand in our garden, we sit and look or lie down and just be. We do not have to read about Ecuador and the Yemen and recycling. We do not have to have an opinion on Extinction Rebellion and Meghan Markle. We don't have to like, retweet or sign up. We can choose not to get involved. There is an enormous freedom that comes from letting go, unplugging and saying, I don't know, I don't have an opinion on that. We can choose the size and nature of our interests and passions, whether they be confined to our four walls or the whole continent and beyond. In a world so fractured and in crisis, we can make it our garden simply to have compassion for one another without judgment, without comparison, without finger pointing. I would like to invite you to stand in my garden from time to time and I would like to stand in yours. We can just be, standing side by side or hand in hand, admiring our handiwork, discussing what still needs to be done. We can have a cup of tea and a chat and put the world to rights. And afterwards, we can walk each other home. Thank you. If you have questions or want to get in touch, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Writers Centre, and you'll find us on Facebook by searching National Centre for Writing. Don't forget to sign up to our weekly newsletter by visiting nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk and clicking the orange drop-down box on the homepage. As a UK-registered charity, we rely on the generosity of our supporters to make our work possible. You can make a donation over on the website today by hitting the Support Us button in the top nav. Don't forget to subscribe, rate and review us because it helps other writers to find the podcast. Thanks again. Keep writing and we'll catch you on the next episode.